the stanzas of Diayan by H. P. Blavatsky. Narrated by Matthew Schmitz. The Secret Books of Lam Rin and Diayan. The Book of Diayan, from the Sanskrit word Diayan, Mystic Meditation is the first volume of the commentaries upon the seven secret folios of Kiyute, and a glossary of the public works of the same name. Thirty-five volumes of Kiyute for exoteric purposes and the use of the layman may be found in the possession of the Tibetan Gelugpa Lamas in the library of any monastery, and also fourteen books of commentaries and annotations on the same by the initiated teachers. Strictly speaking, those thirty-five books ought to be termed the popularized version of the secret doctrine, full of myths, blinds, and errors. The fourteen volumes of commentaries, on the other hand, with their translations, annotations, and an apple glossary of occult terms, worked out from one archaic folio, the Book of the Secret Wisdom of the World, contains a digest of all the occult sciences. These, it appears, are kept secret and apart in the charge of the Teshu Lama of Tiegad Je. The books of Kiyote are comparatively modern, having been edited within the past millennium, whereas the earliest volumes of the commentaries are of untold antiquity, some fragments of the original cylinders having been preserved with the exception that they explain and correct some of the too fabulous and too every appearance, grossly exaggerated accounts in the books of Kiyote, properly so-called the commentaries, have little to do with these. They stand in relation to them as the Chaldeo-Jewish Kabbalah stands to the Mosaic books. In the work known as the Avatam Saka Sutra, in section The Supreme Atman, as manifested in the character of the Arhats and the Pratekya Buddhas, it is stated that, because from the beginning who is in possession of the true knowledge, is asked, the great teachers of the snowy mountain, is the response. These great teachers have been known to live in the snowy range of the Himalayas for countless ages, to deny in the face of millions of Hindus the existence of their great gurus, living in the ashrams scattered all over the trans or the cis himalayan slopes is to make oneself ridiculous in their eyes when the buddhist savior appeared in india their ashrams for it is rarely that these great men are found in lamasaries unless on a short visit were on the spots they now occupy and that even before the brahmins themselves came from central asia to settle on the indus and before that more than one Aryan Devija of fame and historical renown had sat at their feet, learning that which culminated later on in one or another of the great philosophical schools. Most of these Himalayan Bhante were Aryan Brahmins and ascetics. No student, unless very advanced, would be benefited by the perusal of those exotic volumes. They must be read with a key to their meaning, and that key can only be found in the commentaries. Moreover, there are some comparatively modern works that are positively so injurious as far as a fair comprehension of even exoteric Buddhism is concerned. Such are the Buddhist Cosmos by Banze Jinchon of Peking, the Xing Tao Qi, or the Records of the Enlightenment of Tathagata by Wang Puk, 7th century. Hisai Sutra, or Book of Creation, and some others. Synopsis of the First Seven Stanzas Reprinted from the Proem to Volume 1 of The Secret Doctrine The history of cosmic evolution, as traced in the stanzas, is, so to say, the abstract algebraical formula of that evolution. Hence the student must not expect to find there an account of all the stages and transformations which intervene between the first beginnings of universal evolution and our present state. To give such an account would be as impossible as it would be incomprehensible to men who cannot grasp the nature of even the plane of existence next to that which, for the moment, 
their consciousness is limited. The stanzas, therefore, give an abstract formula which can be applied, mutatus mutandis, to all evolution, to that of our tiny earth, to that of the chain of planets of which the earth forms one, to the solar universe, to which that chain belongs, and so on, in an ascending scale, till the mind reels and is exhausted in the effort. The seven stanzas give in this, the first, volume represent the seven terms of this abstract formula. They refer to and describe the seven great stages of the evolutionary process, which are spoken of in the Puranas as the seven creations, and in the Bible as the days of creation. Stanza 1 describes the state of the one all during Pralaya, before the first flutter of reawakening manifestation. A moment's thought shows that such a state can only be symbolized. To describe it is impossible. Nor can it be symbolized except in negatives, for since the state of absoluteness per se, it can possess none of those specific attributes which serve us to describe objects in positive terms. Hence that state can only be suggested by the negatives of all those most abstract attributes which men feel rather than conceive as the remotest limits attainable by their power of conception. Stanza 2 describes a stage which, to a Western mind, is so nearly identical with that mentioned in Stanza 1, that to express the idea of its difference would require a treatise in itself, hence it must be left to the intuition and the higher faculties of the reader to grasp, as far as he can, the meaning of the allegorical phrases used. Indeed, it must be remembered that all these stanzas appeal to the inner faculties rather than to the ordinary comprehension of the physical brain. Stanza 3 describes the reawakening of the universe to life after Pralaya. It depicts the emergence of the monads from their state of absorption within the One, the earliest and highest stage in the formation of worlds. The term monad being one which may apply equally to the vastest solar system or the tiniest atom. Stanza 4 shows the differentiation of the germ of the universe into the septenary hierarchy of conscious divine powers, which are the active manifestations of the one supreme energy. They are the framers, shapers, and ultimately the creators of all the manifested universe in the only sense in which the name Creator is intelligible. They inform and guide it. They are the intelligent beings who adjust and control evolution, embodying in themselves those manifestations of the One Law, which we know as the Laws of Nature. Generally, they are known as the Dian Kohans, though each of the various groups has its own designation in the Secret Doctrine. This stage of evolution is spoken of in Hindu mythology as the creation of the gods. Stanza 5 describes the process of world formation. First diffused cosmic matter, then the fiery whirlwind, the first stage in the formation of a nebula. This nebula condenses and after passing through various transformations form a solar universe, a planetary change, or a single planet as the case may be. Stanza 6 indicates the subsequent stages in the formation of a world and brings the evolution of such a world down to its fourth great period, corresponding to the period in which we are now living. Stanza 7 continues the history, tracing the descent of life down to the appearance of man, and thus closes the first book of the Secret Doctrine. Part 1 Stanza 1 the Eternal Parent, wrapped in her ever-invisible robes, had slumbered once again for seven eternities. Time was not, for it lay asleep in the infinite bosom of duration. Universal Mind was not, for there were no Ah-He to contain it. The Seven Ways to Bliss were not, the Great Causes of Misery were not, for there was no one to produce and get ensnared by them. Darkness alone filled the boundless all, 
for father, mother, and son were once more one, and the son had not yet awakened for the new wheel and his pilgrimage thereon. The seven sublime lords and the seven truths had ceased to be, and the universe, the son of necessity, was immersed in Paranishpana, to be outbreathed by that which is, and yet is not, not was. The causes of existence had been done away with. The visible that was and the invisible that is rested in eternal non-being, the one being. Alone, the one form of existence stretched boundless, infinite, causeless, in dreamless sleep, and life pulsated unconscious in universal space throughout that all-presence, which is sensed by the opened eye of Dang Ma. But where was Dang Ma when the Alaya of the universe was in Paramartha and the great wheel was Anupadaka? Stanza 2. Where were the builders, the luminous sons of Manventarak dawn, in the unknown darkness in their Ahi Paranishpana? The producers of form from no form, the root of the world, the Devamatri and the Svabhavat, rested in the bliss of non-being. Where was silence? Where the ears to sense it? No, there was neither silence nor sound, naught save ceaseless eternal breath, which knows itself not. The hour had not yet struck, the ray had not yet flashed into the germ, the Maitre Padma had not yet swollen. Her heart had not yet opened for the one ray to enter, thence to fall, as three into four, into the lap of Maya. The seven were not yet born from the web of light. Darkness alone was father-mother, Svabhavat, and Svabhavat was in darkness. These two are the germ, and the germ is one. The universe was still concealed in the divine thought and the divine bosom. Stanza 3 The last vibration of the seventh eternity thrills through infinitude. The mother swells, expanding from within without, like the bud of the lotus. The vibration sweeps along, touching with its swift wing the whole universe and the germ that dwelleth in darkness, the darkness that breathes over the slumbering waters of life. Darkness radiates light, and light drops one solitary ray into the waters, into the mother deep. The ray shoots through the virgin egg. The ray causes the eternal egg to thrill and drop the non-eternal germ, which condenses into the world egg. The three fall into the four. The radiant essence becomes seven inside, seven outside. The luminous egg, which in itself is three, curdles and spreads in milk-white curds throughout the depths of mother, the root that grows in the depths of the ocean of life. The root remains, the light remains. The curds remain, and still, Oehu is one. The root of life was in every drop of the ocean of immortality, and the ocean was radiant light, which was fire, and heat, and motion. Darkness vanished and was no more. It disappeared in its own essence, the body of fire and water, of father and mother. Behold, O Lanu, the radiant child of the two, the unparalleled, refulgent glory, bright space, son of dark space, who emerges from the depths of the great dark waters. It is Oehu, the younger. He shine forth as the sun. He is the blazing divine dragon of wisdom. The Eka is Chatur, and Chatur takes to itself Tri, and the union produces the Sapta, in whom are the seven, which become the Tridasha, the hosts and the multitudes. Behold him lifting the veil and unfurling it from east to west. He shuts out the above and leaves the below to be seen as the great illusion. He marks the places for the shining ones and turns the upper into a shoreless sea of fire and the one manifested into the great waters. Where was the germ and where was now darkness? Where is the spirit of the flame that burns in thy lamp, O Lanu? The germ is that 
And that is the light, the white brilliant sun of the dark hidden father. Light is cold flame, and flame is fire, and fire produces heat, which yields water, the water of life in the great mother. Father, mother, spin a web, whose upper end is fastened to spirit, the light of the one darkness and the lower one to its shadowy end, matter. And this web is the universe, spun out of the two substances made in one, which is Svabhavat. It expands when the breath of fire is upon it. It contracts when the breath of the mother touches it. Then the sons dissociate and scatter, to return into their mother's bosom at the end of the great day, and re-become one with her. When it is cooling, it becomes radiant. Its sons expand and contract through their own selves and hearts. They embrace infinitude. Then Svabhavat sent Foet to harden the atoms. Each is a part of the web, reflecting the self-existent Lord, like a mirror. Each becomes, in turn, a world. Stanza 4 Listen, ye sons of the earth, to your instructors, the sons of the fire. Learn there is neither first nor last, for all is one number, issued from no number. Learn what we who descend from the primordial seven, we who are born from the primordial flame, have learnt from our fathers. From the effulgency of light, the ray of the ever-darkness, sprang in space the reawakened energies, the one from the egg, the six, and the five, then the three, the one, the four, the one, the five, the twice seven, the sum total. And these are the essences, the flames, the elements, the builders, the numbers, the arupa, the rupa, and the force or divine man, the sum total. And from the divine man emanated the forms, the sparks, the sacred animals, and the messengers of the sacred fathers within the holy four. This was the army of the voice, the divine mother of the seven. The sparks of the seven are subject to and the servants of, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh of the seven. These are called spheres, triangles, cubes, lines, and modelers, for thus stands the eternal Nidyana, the Oihahau, the Oihaihau, which is darkness, the boundless, or the no number, Adi Nidyana Svabhavat, the O, the Adi Sanat, the number, for he is one, the voice of the word, Svabhavat, the numbers, for he is one and nine, the formless square. And these three enclosed within the O are the sacred four, and the ten are the Arupa universe. Then come the sons, the seven fighters, the one, the eight left out, and his breath, which is the light maker. Then the second seven, who are the Lipika, produced by the three. The rejected sun is one. The sun suns are countless. Stanza 5 The primordial seven, the first seven breaths of the dragon of wisdom, produce in their turn from their holy circumgyrating breaths the fiery whirlwind. They make of him the messenger of their will. The Diyu becomes Fohat the swift son of the divine sons, who are sons of the Lupika, runs circular errands. Foat is the steed, and the thought is the rider. He passes like lightning through the fiery clouds, takes three and five and seven strides through the seven regions above and seven below. He lifts his voice and calls the innumerable sparks and joins them together. He is their guiding spirit and leader, when he commences work, he separates the sparks of the lower kingdom that float and thrill with joy in their radiant dwellings, and forms therewith the germs of wheels. He places them in the six directions of space, and one in the middle, the central wheel. Foat traces spiral lines to unite the sixth to the seventh, the crown. 
An army of the Sons of Light stands at each angle, the Lepika in the middle wheel. They say, this is good. The first divine world is ready. The first, the second. Then the divine Arupa reflects itself in Chayaloka, the first garment of Anupadaka. Boet takes five strides and builds a winged wheel at each corner of the square of the four holy ones and their armies. The Lepika circumscribe the triangle, the first one, the cube, the second one, and the pentacle within the egg. It is the ring called Pass Not, for those who descend and ascend, who during the Kelpa are progressing towards the great day, be with us, thus perform the Arupa and the Rupa, from one light, seven lights, from each of the seven, seven times, seven lights. The wheels watch the ring. Stanza 6. By the power of the Mother of Mercy and Knowledge, Quan Yin, the triple of Quan Sha Yin, residing in Quan Yin Tian, Boat, the breath of their progeny, the son of the sons, having called forth from the lower abyss the elusive form of Xian Chan and the seven elements. The swift and the Radiant One produces the seven Laya centers, against which none will prevail to the great day, be with us, and seats the universe on these eternal foundations, surrounding Xian Chan with the elementary germs. Of the seven, first one manifested, six concealed, two manifested, five concealed, three manifested, four concealed, four produced, three hidden, Four and one, San revealed. Two and one, half concealed. Six to be manifested. One laid aside. Lastly, seven small wheels revolving, one giving birth to the other. He builds them in the likeness of older wheels, placing them on the imperishable centers. How does Foet build them? He collects the fiery dust. He makes balls of fire, runs through them, and round them infusing life therein too, then sets them into motion, some one way, some the other way. They are cold, he makes them hot. They are dry, he makes them moist. They shine, he fans and cools them. Thus acts Foet from one twilight to the other during seven eternities. At the fourth, the sons are told to create their images. One third refuses, two obey. The curse is pronounced. They will be born in the fourth, suffer and cause suffering. This is the first war. The older wheels rotated downward and upward. The mother's spawn filled the hole. There were battles fought between the creators and the destroyers, and battles fought for space, the seed appearing and reappearing continuously. Make thy calculations, O Lanu if thou wouldst learn the correct age of thy small wheel. Its fourth spoke is our mother. Reach the fourth fruit of the fourth path of knowledge that leads to nirvana, and thou shalt comprehend, for thou shalt see. Stanza 7 Behold the beginning of sentient formless life. First the divine, the one from the mother spirit, then the spiritual, the three from the one, the four from the one, and the five, from which the three, the five, and the seven. These are the threefold and the fourfold downward, the mind-born sons of the first Lord, the shining seven. It is they who are thou, I, he, O Lanu, they who watch over thee and thy mother, Bumi. The one ray multiplies the smaller rays. Life precedes form, and life survives, the last atom. Through countless rays the life ray, the one, like a thread through many beads. When the one becomes two, the threefold appears, and the three are one, and it is our thread, O Lanu, the heart of the man-plant called Saptaparna. It is the root that never dies, the three-tongued flame of the four wicks. The wicks are the sparks, that draw from the three-tongued flame shot out by the seven, their flame, 
the beams and sparks of one moon reflected in the running waves of all the rivers of earth. The spark hangs from the flame by the finest thread of Foet. It journeys through the seven worlds of Maya. It stops in the first, and is a metal and a stone. It passes into the second, and behold, a plant. The plant whirls through the seven changes and becomes a sacred animal. From the combined attributes of these, Manu, the thinker, is formed. Who forms him? The seven lives and the one life. Who completes him? The fivefold La. And who perfects the last body? Fish, Sin, and Soma. From the firstborn, the thread between the silent watcher and his shadow becomes more strong and radiant with every change. The morning sunlight has changed into noonday glory. This thy present wheel, said the flame to the spark, thou art myself, my image, and my shadow. I have clothed myself in thee, and thou art my veon, to the day be with us. When thou shalt re-become myself and others, thyself and me. Then the builders, having donned their first clothing, descent on radiant earth and reign over men, who are themselves. Part 2. Anthropogenesis From the Second Volume of The Secret Doctrine only forty-nine shlokas, out of several hundred, are here given, and not every verse is translated verbatim, a paraphrasis being sometimes used for the sake of clearness and intelligibility, where a literal translation would be quite unintelligible. The stanzas, with the commentaries thereon, in this volume are drawn from the same archaic records as the stanzas on cosmogony, in volume one. As far as possible, a verbatim translation is given, but some of the stanzas are too obscure to be understood without explanation, and therefore, as in Volume 1, they are first given in full as they stand, and then, when taken verse by verse with their commentaries, an attempt is made to make them clearer, by words added in footnotes, in anticipation of the fuller explanation of the commentary. As regards the evolution of mankind, the secret doctrine postulates three new propositions, which stand in direct antagonism to modern science, as well to current religious dogmas. It teaches a. The simultaneous evolution of seven human groups on seven different portions of our globe. b. The birth of the astral before the physical body, the former being a model for the latter, and c. That man, in this round, preceded every mammalian the anthropoids included in the animal kingdom. Secret Doctrine, Volume 2 Stanza 1 The La, which turns the fourth, is servant to the La of the seventh. They who revolve, driving their chariots around their Lord, the one eye of our world. His breath gave life to the seven, it gave life to the first. Said the earth, Lord of the shining face, my house is empty. Send thy sons to people this wheel. Thou hast sent thy seven sons to the Lord of Wisdom. Seven times doth he see thee nearer to himself. Seven times more doth he feel thee. Thou hast forbidden thy servants, the small rings, to catch thy light and heat, thy great bounty to intercept on its passage. Send now thy servant the same. Said the Lord of the Shining Face, I shall send thee a fire when thy work is commenced. Raise thy voice to other lokas. Ply to thy father, the Lord of the Lotus, for his sons, thy people, shall be under the rule of the fathers. Thy men shall be mortals. The men of the Lord of Wisdom, not the sons of Soma, are immortal. Cease thy complaints. Thy seven skins are yet on thee. Thou art not yet ready. Thy men are not yet ready. After great throes, she cast off her old three and put on her new seven skins, and stood in her first one. Stanza 2 The wheel whirled for thirty crores more. It constructed rupas, soft stones that hardened, hard plants that softened, visible from invisible insects and small lives, 
She took them off her back whenever they overran the mother. After thirty crores, she turned around. She lay on her back, on her side. She would call no sons of heaven. She would ask no sons of wisdom. She created from her own bosom. She evolved watermen, terrible and bad. The watermen, terrible and bad, she herself created from the remains of others. From the dross and slime of her first, second, and third, she formed them. The Diani came and looked. The Diani, from the bright father-mother, from the white regions they came, from the abodes of the immortal mortals. Displeased they were, our flesh is not there, no fit rupas for our brothers of the fifth, no dwellings for the lives. Pure waters, not turbid, they must drink. Let us dry them. The flames came, the fires with the sparks, the night fires and the day fires. They dried out the turbid dark waters. With their heat they quenched them. The laws of the high, the la mayin of below, came. They slew the forms which were two and four-faced. They fought the goat men and the dog-headed men and the men with fishes' bodies. Mother Water, the great sea, wept. She arose, she disappeared in the moon, which had lifted her, which had given her birth. When they were destroyed, Mother Earth remained bare. She asked to be dried. Stanza 3 The Lord of the Lords came. From her body he separated the waters. And that was heaven above, the first heaven. The great Kohans, called the Lords of the Moon, of the airy bodies. Bring forth men, men of your nature. Give them their forms within. She will build coverings without. Males, females, will they be, Lords of the Flame also. They went each on his allotted land, seven of them, each on his lot. The Lords of the Flame remain behind. They would not go. They would not create. Stanza 4 The seven hosts, the will-born lords, propelled by the spirit of life-giving, separate men from themselves, each on his own zone. Seven times seven shadows of future men were born, each of his own color and kind, each inferior to his father. The fathers, the boneless, could be given no life to beings with bones, their progeny were Buddha, with neither form nor mind. Therefore they are called the Chaya race. How are the Manushaya born? The Manus with minds, how are they made? The fathers called to their help their own fire, which is the fire that burns in earth, the spirit of the earth, called to his help the solar fire. These three produced in their joint efforts a good Rupa, it could stand, walk, run, recline, or fly. Yet it was still but a chaya, a shadow with no sense. The breath needed a form. The fathers gave it. The breath needed a gross body. The earth molded it. The breath needed the spirit of life. The solar laws breathed it into its form. The breath needed a mirror of its body. We gave it our own said the Dianes. The breath needed a vehicle of desires. It has it, said the drainer of waters. But breath needs a mind to embrace the universe. We cannot give that, said the fathers. I never had it, said the spirit of the earth. The form would be consumed were I to give it mine, said the great fire. Man remained an empty, senseless Buddha. Thus, have the boneless given life to those who became men with bones in the third. Stanza 5 The first were the sons of Yoga, their sons the children of the Yellow Father and the White Mother. The second race was the product by budding and expansion, the asexual from the sexless. Thus was, O Lanu, the second race produced. Their fathers were the self-born, the self-born, the chaya, from the brilliant bodies of the lords, the fathers, the sons of twilight. 
When the race became old, the old waters mixed with the fresher waters. When its drop became turbid, they vanished and disappeared in the new stream, in the hot stream of life. The outer of the first became the inner of the second. The old wing became the new shadow, and the shadow of the wing. Stanza 6 When the second evolved, the egg born, the third. The sweat grew, its drops grew, and the drops became hard and round. The sun warmed it, the moon cooled and shaped it, the wind fed it until its ripeness. The white swan from the starry vault overshadowed the big drop. The egg of the future race, the man swan of the later third. First male, female, then man and woman. The self-born were the chayas, the shadows from the bodies of the sons of twilight. Neither water nor fire could destroy them. Their sons were. Stanza 7 the sons of wisdom, the sons of night, ready for rebirth, came down. They saw the vile forms of the first third. We can choose, said the lords, we have wisdom. Some entered the chayas. Some projected a spark. Some deferred till the fourth. From their own rupa, they filled the kama. Those who entered became arhats. Those who received but a spark remained destitute of knowledge. The spark burned low. The third remained mindless. Their jivas were not ready. They were set apart among the seven. They became narrow-headed. The third were ready. In these shall we dwell, said the lords of the flame and of the dark wisdom. How did the manas, the sons of wisdom, act? They rejected the self-born. They are not ready. They spurned the sweat-born. They are not quite ready. They would not enter the first egg-born. When the sweat-born produced the egg-born, the twofold, the mighty, the powerful with bones, the lords of wisdom said, Now shall we create. The third race became the Vahan of the lords of wisdom. It created sons of will and yoga. By Kriya Shakti it created them, the holy fathers, ancestors of the Arats. Stanza 8. From the drops of sweat, from the residue of the substance, matter from dead bodies of men and animals of the wheel of before, and from cast-off dust, the first animals were produced. Animals with bones, dragons of the deep, and flying sarpas, were added to the creeping things. They that creep on the ground got wings. They of the long necks in the water became the progenitors of the fowls of the air. During the third, the boneless animals grew and changed. They became animals with bones. Their chayas became solid. The animals separated the first. They began to breed. The twofold man separated also, he said. Let us as they, let us unite and make creatures. They did. And those who had spark took huge she-animals unto them. They begat upon them dumb races. Dumb they were themselves, but their tongue untied. The tongues of their progeny remained still. Monsters they bred, a race of crooked, red-haired, covered monsters going on all fours. A dumb race to keep the shame untold. Stanza 9 Seeing which, the laws who had not built men wept, saying, The Amanasa have defiled our future abodes. This is karma. Let us dwell in the others. Let us teach them better, lest worse should happen. They did. Then all men became endowed with manas. They saw the sin of the mindless. The fourth race developed speech. The one became two. Also all the living and creeping things that were still one. Giant fish, birds, and serpents with shell heads. Stanza 10 Thus, two by two, on the seven zones, the third race gave birth to the fourth. The sura became a sura. The first, one every zone, was moon-colored, the second yellow like gold, the third red, the fourth brown, which became black with sin. 
The first seven human shoots were all of one complexion. The next seven began mixing. Then the third and fourth became tall with pride. We are the kings, we are the gods. They took wives fair to look upon, wives from the mindless, the narrow-headed. They bred monsters, wicked demons, male and female, also Kado, with little minds. They built temples for the human body, male and female they worshipped. Then the third eye acted no longer. Stanza 11 They built huge cities, of rare earths and metals they built, out of the fires vomited out of the white stone, of the mountains and of the black stone, they cut their own images, in their size and likeness, and worshipped them. They built great images nine yatis high, the size of their bodies. Inner fires had destroyed the land of their fathers. The water threatened the fourth. The first great waters came. They swallowed the seven great islands. All holy saved the unholy destroyed. With them, most of the huge animals produced from the seat of the earth. Stanza 12 Few remained, some yellow, some brown and black, some red remained. The moon-colored were gone forever. The fifth produced from the holy stock remained. It was ruled over by the first divine kings. The serpents who redescended, who made peace with the fifth, who taught and instructed it.